I don't need to do anything to get more power out of it. The thing has plenty of power as it is. The thing has plenty of power, plenty of power, power, power. 20 minutes later. Well, you boys did it. Enough of you commented on my YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and wherever else y'all be trying to convince me to buy new things for the Miata. And no matter how many times I replied saying, not really interested, or I don't really know if it's gonna be worth it, I bought it. So without further ado, let's crack into my brand new Maruha Motors Japan stroker crankshaft for the BP engine. Even the shipping labels are so legit on this thing. In case you haven't noticed, I did buy this from my friends at Boffy Racing. I also got this sick banner from them. I have a link down to them down below in the description. If you wanna buy yourself a Maruha Stroker Crank or any part that they carry, they are the premier MX-5 tuning shop and parts dealer in the UK. And any purchase you make using my link in the description does help out the Car Passion channel, so I greatly appreciate it. But anyways, let's jump into this thing. Today on the Car Passion channel, I learn how to open a box. Oh man. Oh my gosh, look at this. It's so legit. So I, I still don't really know if this is gonna be worth it or not, but so many people commented wanting to see me buy this. And it's really one of the only mods I could think of that actually has the potential to broaden the power band of the engine without making any major compromise. Dude, you know I'm saving that box. Man, they really don't want any children to open this crankshaft. And that's bad news because I am a child. Give me my crankshaft. Oh, oh wait, I still can't see it. We're getting closer though. And yes, that is my stock crankshaft. So we can compare the two side by side. Of course, I'll bust out the scale in a second to see uh, this is advertised as being one kilogram lighter or just over two pounds. We'll see the exact difference here in just a minute. Is it a crankshaft or is it a Philly cheese steak? Oh my goodness. Yes. Oh my God. A brand new crankshaft. I'm going to be very careful with this thing. So while we take a look at this absolute piece of art, let's talk about displacement real quick. I've seen many people refer to what's called the Maruha 2.1 liter stroker kit, but there are actually a few stages in between the stock 1.8 liter displacement, technically 1839 cc's, and the full blown 2.1 liter kit. And you have a couple considerations to make along the way. First, the crankshafts. Maruha makes three different cranks, one with the stock 85 millimeter stroke, one with 87 millimeter stroke, that's what you see here, and one with 89 millimeter stroke. The reason I didn't go with the 89 millimeter is because it requires custom pistons, and I didn't want to delay the project by two months just waiting for those. If you were to use an off-the-shelf piston with the big stroker crank, the piston would stick up too far off the block deck and contact the cylinder head, unless you run a ridiculously thick head gasket that doesn't even exist. Anyways, even if you were to put the big stroker crank in an engine with custom stock 83 millimeter diameter pistons, you'd still only be at 1.9 liters or 1926 cc's to be exact. But that is where the full Maruha stroker kit comes in, right? Then you get the big 89 millimeter crankshaft paired with oversized 85 and a half millimeter pistons, which brings the total displacement to 2043 cc's, so still technically only a 2.0 liter. I'm not exactly sure why they market it as a 2.1, but it is what it is. You can, however, achieve 2.1 liters or 2068 cc's by going up to an 86 millimeter piston. This will need to be custom ordered, but you'll need custom pistons anyways at this point, so it's not really a big deal. 
There's another catch though. Due to inconsistencies in the OEM castings from Mazda, not all blocks have thick enough cylinder walls to handle 86 millimeter boring, and the ones that are thick enough certainly won't be strong enough to handle any significant amount of boost pressure. So those are some of the things you need to consider when you're changing your displacement. There's a link in the description to an engine displacement calculator where you can play with all the various bore and stroke combos for yourself, and I'll go into some more details on this stuff during the actual engine assembly process, but hopefully that gives you a good overview. A few cool upgrades this crank has over a stock one are number one, a longer nose which gives better support to the harmonic balancer. It's got removable galley plugs for easier maintenance as opposed to the wrist rocket ammunition that's pressed into the stock crank, and it's also 3.2 pounds lighter at 33.2 pounds compared to the stock crank which weighs in at 36.4 pounds, and that's just better for great engine response and snappiness. Now if that ain't street cred, I don't know what is. Now I cannot wait to see everything assembled in the engine, including those beautiful Mazworks billet main caps, but of course everything has to go to the machine shop first. So now that I have the crankshaft, I'll be heading to the machine shop tomorrow. I'll be bringing my block so I can have the cylinders freshened up and matched to the new pistons I'm using, which are the same bore and compression ratio as before. I think the old ones would have been okay, but I just kind of feel better spending a few hundred bucks for a fresh set of slugs. I just slapped the valves on the cylinder head a couple months ago, so all I need there is a fresh resurface due to the type of gasket that I use. Oh, and I also bought a new ACT pressure plate which is rated for 702 foot-pounds of torque, because somehow the 500 foot-pound pressure plate wasn't quite enough. It's a Miata, bro, I shouldn't even be mentioning numbers this high. But for anyone with a K-Miata trans swap kit who wants to upgrade their pressure plate, the ACT part number for this thing is B015X, and I do believe the B stands for bad to the bone, but I couldn't find anything on ACT's site to confirm that. Anyways, while I'm still in the garage, I wanted to let you guys know that I do have a new run of motivational moving parts available on the website in case anyone wants to make a donation to this absurd engine build. I have the broken main caps, bent main studs, the old pistons, and all of the bearing shells available, and if you want me to sign anything, that's a free option, just add it to the cart, and as always, thank you for the support. Another perk of being into Miata engines. Let's see you do that with an LS block. So let's review everything that I'm bringing to the machine shop. I have the pressure plate and the flywheel along with the pressure plate bolts. I also have the flywheel bolts in a separate bag so that can be bolted to the crankshaft during balancing. I have obviously the engine block. I have the cylinder head with no cams or lifters, um, not getting a valve job or anything done on that. If you are getting a valve job done, they do need to have your cams, lifters, shims, so they can set up your valve lash if you have solid lifters in your engine. All I'm having done to this head is, like I said, just getting the cut rings shaved off of it that were put in there by the head gasket, so I have a fresh surface on this. I've also got the main studs. I have my Mosworks billet main caps. Those will be going onto the block and getting line board. I have my original manly connecting rods. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with these, so I plan on just reusing them. I have the Beast Mode Maruha crankshaft, and you need to have all these parts, not only for balancing, but also for the machine shop to check the clearances. I have the bearings, but they're actually already at the machine shop. One of my followers actually hooked me up with a set of bearings during this global bearing shortage that we're having. So check out his Instagram, go like some of his photos. He also has a 400 wheel horsepower 1.6, so that is straight epic. I'm also bringing my original crankshaft to get inspected for straightness, damage, balance, all that, because I might use that in a future project. You never know. I'll talk about exactly what I'm telling the machine shop in just a second, but I wanna get on the road, so let's go ahead and do that. Oh yeah, and of course, pistons and rings. I forgot to mention that because those are already at the machine shop as well. So there are really five main clearances they need to be concerned with in the bottom end of the engine. This excludes the cylinder head. Thrust clearance, main bearing clearance, rod bearing clearance, piston to wall clearance, and ring gap. The thrust clearance should be between six and nine thousandths of an inch, but I don't even tell anything to the machine shop because it's so rare that you'll need some kind of additional machining in order to achieve the correct clearance if you're using a factory block, a factory crank, 
and new thrust bearings. Usually motors that have too high of a thrust clearance, it's because the bearings are worn out and they just need new bearings. So I don't mention anything to the machine shop, but you definitely need to check it still when you assemble your motor. For rod bearings, I told them I want between 20 and 22 thousandths of an inch. And for main bearing clearance, I want between 18 and 20 thousandths of an inch. And that just has to do with making sure there's enough oil cushion in the bearing so when it's under the stresses that it's under, the metal parts are not coming into contact with each other. Now the other two clearances have more to do with things getting hotter as they expand, and that's number one, piston to wall clearance. And that's simply how big the gap is between your piston and your cylinder wall. You gotta have enough room for the piston to grow because if the piston to wall clearance is too tight, what will happen is the piston will try to outgrow the cylinder and then you'll get metal to metal contact and your engine is RIP at that point. And we got ourselves a race, boys. It's a CTSV and a Mustang GT. I do not condone street racing, but I will watch while other people do it. And the final clearance you need to be concerned with is the piston ring end gap. Basically how much of a gap there is in your piston ring when it sits inside the bore. And that has to do with the ring growing when it gets hot and you don't want those ends to get too close or specifically you don't want the ends to touch because what will happen is it'll most likely immediately rip the top off of your piston and once again your engine is RIP. On my engine I'll be using the same gaps that I was before and that's 17 thousandths of an inch for the top ring and 19 thousandths of an inch for the bottom ring. Now where the heck do I get all these numbers? There's so much controversy online as far as like what clearances you're supposed to have in your engine. Basically, I just asked other people that run similar power levels what their clearances are, and I collected that data from several different people and good sources, and then I came up with numbers that I wanted to run. And I'm running all of the same clearances that I was before, so I'll have the machine shop check all of those clearances for me, but they will not do the final assembly. I'll get all the parts back myself where I will also check those clearances and then I will assemble the engine myself. Now, I don't consider myself exactly a qualified engine builder, but I would still much rather just take my time building my own engine. And then if there is some kind of failure, well, it's more on me than anyone else, where if I have someone else build the engine and there is a failure, then it's kind of hard to go back and blame machine shops for engine failures on high performance engines. I can just really take my time and make sure everything is up to my own standards. So anyways, if you guys have any questions about going to the machine shop, clearances, parts, anything like that, um, like I said, I'm no professional, but I can lend my opinions. Go ahead and drop your questions down below in the comments. So I stopped by Advanced Engine Dynamics on the way to the machine shop. You guys know Advanced Engine Dynamics by now. It's the dyno shop that I frequent with the Miatas. I talked to Toby and he says, dude, if you're gonna do it up, do it up. And what he meant is, I run the car on E85 all the time. Why don't you go higher compression? Or you could go a little bit more on the bore size. And I was going to just put the same spec pistons back in it, an 84 millimeter piston with the same compression ratio that's about nine to one. But now that I think about it, there is room for just a little more send in this motor. So between you guys convincing me to put the stroker crank in it, and now Toby convincing me to just squeeze a little bit more out of those pistons, I'm faced with a decision. So I'm between two different spec pistons here. The motor is currently an 84 millimeter piston, I could go to an 84 and a half millimeter piston that would bump the displacement up slightly. The cool part about that is it would bump the displacement up to 1951 cc's. So technically I could refer to the engine as a two liter. And as much as that would be awesome and sound cool and everything, I don't think I'm gonna do that. Let me tell you about the other option first. The other Wiseco piston that's on the shelf and available right now is another 84 millimeter, so the displacement would stay the same, but it's higher compression. So it's a, I think it's a 10 to one, now I can't remember, I should know. I think it's a 10 to one piston, 
plus I have a head shave plus a stroker crank, which raises the compression a little bit more, probably putting it in the 11.0 to one range. So between those two options, I'm leaning towards going for the higher compression. With the slightly larger bore, yeah, I could call it a two liter, which would be cool, but I'm shaving off precious cylinder wall, which I don't really want to do. People say, at least on the internet, that once you start getting up into the 85 or 85 and a half millimeter pistons, it gets pretty squirrely to try to run boost. Now, I don't know how many documented cases there are of people putting big pistons like 85 plus millimeter running boost and blowing holes in their cylinder walls, but I don't really wanna be the first one to find out because that's gonna be an expensive uh, test. The other thing is when you bore the engine up, technically you lose a little bit of compression. So yes, I would be gaining 23 cc's of displacement, but I'd also be losing a tiny bit of compression and those things might completely offset each other. So I think the better solution here is just gonna be go to the high comp it's gonna be a 1928cc, 1.9 liter, but I think that'll get me closer towards my goal of just having like the ultimate BP power band. Now, speaking of that, in my mind, when I go back to the dyno to tune this fresh engine, I think I'm actually going, I'm not gonna to try to make like a new horsepower record for the car or anything like that. I think I'm actually gonna back it down a little bit because I know that that thing was tuned pretty much to the limit as far as how much ignition timing I could run and I was over spinning the turbo big time to get over the 500 wheel horsepower uh, number. So I think that what's going to be even more optimal is something around 450 wheel horsepower with an even fatter power band. I can get hopefully more aggressive spool up in the lower RPM and just faster response in general with the bump and displacement from the stroker crank and the bump and compression, which should be completely safe on E85. Obviously, it'll take a complete retune to get there, but I think it's going to be rad. So anyways, let me know down in the comments below what you would do if this was your engine. I think I'm pretty decided on what I'm going to do, but I'm always interested to hear your guys' opinions. Now, the NB, all it really needs right now to continue progressing that project is I have to pull the head and it has to get a valve job. I know I haven't said a single thing about it for like months now and people are asking in the comments. Yes, it's the engine is still low on compression on one cylinder. I still have to do that. I've been trying to avoid having both Miatas down at once, but I think what I'm going to try to do is just get that done in a weekend and I'll just Uber to the machine shop or something. I don't know, but I want to keep progressing that project as well. Um, and I still got a bunch of stuff to do to the chassis in the red car while the engine's out of it. But anyways, that's my update for the week. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something and I will see you in the next one. Peace out.